the world and its inhabitants are overwhelmed. Human beings on the face of this earth are so overwhelmed by spiritual darkness, by ignorance, by stupidity. So someone there says, well, there is a way out. There's a way you can do it. But let me tell you, sir, the advisor tells the man who wants out, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. You're going to have to pay attention every minute because here's the way out. And it's explained to the man who wants to escape. Here's a boat. You can have this boat it's for anyone who wants to leave. And you get in the boat all alone. You can't take anyone with you. You can't take your wife or husband. You get in the boat and see that little stream over there, just narrow enough for one boat? That stream that cuts into the jungle and goes all the way to the other side, that stream will indeed take you out of the jungle with all its vines and wild animals. So you get in the boat. Now here's the single most important thing, sir, that you have to remember. When you get in there, you have to pay attention every second to what you are doing. And I want to tell you, if you decide to go, I want to tell you something. Thousands of people who were in here, caught in here before, have asked me the same question. And they started off, and they didn't make it to the other side. But if you pay attention to what I'm telling you, if you stay wide awake and know what you're doing at the moment you're doing it, you won't make the mistake they did. And here's the mistake they made. They got into the boat and pushed off and started the little motor at the back, little outboard motor. And they started churning their way down the little narrow stream, which twists and turns all the way out to the other side. But here's what happened. They got out a little ways out, a couple hundred yards, and there was a tiger off to the side or a lion or some other fierce animal that distracted their attention. And instead of paying attention to where they should be going, they went into fear and saw that fierce animal over there. And when they looked back, they didn't know where they were. And that few seconds of distraction of looking aside, the boat had gone. They see, the boat is going all the time. Your life is going all the time while you're seated here. Right now, as you're seated here, your boat is going through that jungle. Are you paying attention to it? Do you know where you are right now? Are you aware that you're in this room? This room exists, and you exist. Are you aware that you're in it? Do you know what you're doing with your facial expression and with your hands? Can you understand what's going on inside of you? Even while I'm talking to you, the boat is churning through that stream for each one of you as you're seated here tonight. <coughs> and the man went on to explain further hazards as the boat continued to go. All of a sudden he was surprised to see an exploring party off to one side. And there they were camped off to one side of the little stream and he was curious. He felt a little lonely, and the, the sight of other human beings suddenly made him excited. So he looked over, and when he looked back again, he didn't know where he was, because the boat had continued, but he didn't know where it had gone. It had gone off the main stream, because he hadn't been paying attention to what he was doing at the moment he was doing it. He wasn't watching the stream. On and on, the man explained different hazards that went through him, for example, the, all the hazards are not outward, they are inward too. Your tension, over, your tension over whether you're going to make it or not. Who said that that tension is ever right? And a storm came up and the storm beat down on him and he wondered whether he'd be knocked out of his boat by the ferocity of it. So sir, the advisor told him, you can see why I told you that many people have started off finally ended up lost out there in the jungle that they tried to go through because they don't pay attention because they surrendered to something of no value whatever. 
You don't have to look aside. It is possible for you to look straight forward and see what you're doing. But look at the howl of your fears. Your fear of disgrace, as if you had anything of value to begin with. The fear of losing someone, of losing your present values of yourself. So the man got in his boat, and we'll make this a success story, because it can be done. And when he finally reached the outside of the jungle, he'd been through something. Ah, he knew how fierce the competition was for his attention. How everything outside and inside screamed for it. Of course he was tempted, but he's, he understood what temptation was. <coughs> and he refused to look. See, what you're doing psychologically is listening to your own howls inside. And, and when you look and listen to them, the boat continues to drift and go off into some little side channel and all of a sudden you wake up and you uh, I wake up temporarily and you say what happened to me how many times in your life have all of a sudden you've you've said to yourself in bitterness and resentment how did I get into this you'll know the answer how do, how do I get how did I get into this when you reach the outside You'll know how, how frequent as well as fierce as the temptations. How, how you want to look and how you want to, how you want to go into gloom. How you won't want to go into depression. How you want to go into bitterness. How you want to go into pretense that you already know. Look at that one for a bit. We haven't discussed that for a while. All lost people in their little boat pathetically wandering around lonely out in that jungle, they looked aside and pretended that they understood where they were going when they really didn't. And they might have even stopped to talk with people off on the side of the stream, stopped and chatted and talked to them about how nice it is to be on your way out from the jungle. Religious people do that. And they're not religious at all. They're not spiritual at all. They use religious words and they talk about God and reality right in the middle of the jungle. And they don't know what it means to be free. All right. Where are you? What did you do today? Where did you look today where you should have kept your attention in? Uh, let's see. Just now... I am picking up the spoon to put some coffee into the coffee cup. At this very minute, I'm driving my car down the highway and I'm paying attention to my driving, as a good driver should do. Just now, I became aware of a certain thought that went through my mind, a thought that was suddenly gloomy, and you saw that thought. I'll tell you one of the greatest distractions that people are unaware of. And now you're going to be aware of it, so now you can't use it as an alibi anymore. Your boat is going through the jungle and you're on your way out. And you're distracted by the thought that you must become this or that kind of a person. Let's list a few. Now please, if you, if you don't know that you're saying this, then you're going to miss most of what I'm telling you. And so I'll start all over. One of your greatest accidents that you have going through the jungle is the lure on the side of the jungle of you thinking that you must be this kind of a described person or that kind. Examples. I must be safe. And I'll give you a list of them, and then we'll go into some details on them. I must be safe. I must be respected. I must be successful. I must be entertained. I must be someone who is cared for 
by someone else. I must be loved. I must be someone who is loving. I must be someone who has exciting places to go and exciting things to do. All people who are lost out in that jungle in their little lonely boat, all people who are there are people who have started the sentence with, I must be, and then filled it in according to their conditioning, according to their desire, according to their anxiety, or whatever. Let's take the idea of being religious as a starter. I must be religious, or I must be spiritual. All right. What on earth are you talking about? I must be spiritual, but now where are you going to get the supporting, supportive ideas for what it means to be religious? Oh, that's simply answered. You're going to get it from previous sources, according to your denomination that you were brought up with, or a new one you adopted later on. Or you're going to get it from ideas you've read in a book. You're going to pick it up according to ideas that you think will make you a religious, spiritual person. Which, by the way, the only reason you do that is because you feel empty and you think that filling it with religious words and phrases and traditions and activities and ceremonies, you think that filling that up will make you a certain kind of a person. And by the way, in your sickness, you think that it's going to make you a certain kind of a person on whom God will have mercy. By the way, why do you think that God must have mercy on you? What have you been doing? Why do you think God must look down and forgive you? Ah, I know why. Let's see if you know why. Because now the kind of a person you are is a great sinner who has repented. And you have done it again. Now you're, now you're a thousand miles away from that stream that you were told to look at. Wandering out there, thinking, thinking that God Almighty is paying attention to your egotism when he knows nothing of it, whatever. Do you understand that? That God doesn't know darkness. He understands it, but he's not a part of it. He's not looking down at wicked human beings as you think he is. But people will do almost anything, especially when they're in trouble, of course. They'll do almost anything to try to get some kind of a connection with deity, with God. And immediately they feel what they call better. Because they now think they have an ally. This is, again, one of the things that people think they are. I am now, the person thinks, I am now a person on whom God is going to have mercy. He's going to forgive me for the small sins I've committed. He's going to <clears throat> pay attention to me and eventually take me up to eternity and, and on and on. There is the description of another description of being a certain kind of a person. Now, listen to this as a beginning summary. Only with the dropping of all the distractions of looking left and right, will you finally make it through the jungle and out into liberty? Because all thoughts that you think involve you as this or that kind of a person, including a person who says there is no point trying to get through the jungle, it's too much for me, I can't make it, therefore I give up. See, I gave up 
That's the kind of a person I am. He is, which he is not. And look what a flood of hell he has now let loose. First of all, inside himself. A defeated man is a violent man. A depressed woman is a violent woman. A person who has the I, the self, the false identity of someone who's been defeated can now explain why with another lie. I am defeated because of what was done to me. I have a right to give up, to be bitter, to be hard. I have a right to grab what I can from this world because of what other people have done to me. They have grabbed everything to me. Let me tell you, I write this down too sometime. There really actually is such a thing as being a spiritual hero. Now, now please, I am using words deliberately because we have to communicate with words as being a spiritual hero. But when you get outside the jungle completely, you'll understand the words without connecting it with anything in you because there won't be anything left of you when you get out of there. But you'll understand the words and the proper use of the word spiritual hero. And you'll understand how very few there are in this world because everyone else has preferred to be a spiritual coward. I want you to add this method to your process of getting out. We've had it before, but I want to impress you with it. And those of you who are listening perhaps for the first few times, please remember this. Make it a habit from now on to stay in the middle of the stream where you should be by periodically, say every five minutes, interrupting yourself and asking yourself, what am I like right now? That will prevent you from looking left and right, from being lured over into things that will take your mind off the center of the stream. What am I like right now? That is what is passing through me. Oh, what a shock this is going to give you. It, it, shock is the... It's going to turn everything upside down in your life and back and forth again. If you do it, and most people won't because they're such liars. <coughs> they, or they lie and say, well, what's passing through me now is, is a state of love. What's passing through you now if you say that there's a state of love is a state of hatred. Spirit, a real spiritual hero in the eyes of God Almighty is someone who will do this every day and not identify with what he sees, not to, think, not to think that even the evil you see represents you because it doesn't. It represents a state that is taking you over. All this that we've talked about will become clearer to you every mile of progress that you make through the jungle. And you will see, thank heaven, that the rest of your life here on earth can make sense, perfect sense, increasingly beautiful sense. Where, where, where you understand at last what happiness is, which is the happiness of getting rid of your old nature, the old jungle nature, every day getting rid of a little bit, and then you get automatically happy. You don't have to look for it. It comes to you. See, your life doesn't make any sense at all to you now. Oh, come on, stop lying. Some of you out there, back wherever you are, lying about it already. Your life doesn't make one bit of sense at all, and you don't have the honesty or the decency to admit it. That's why you are a thousand miles lost out in that jungle, scared and lonely and hypocritical and hateful. Well, a God that you don't know has provided you with that stream, and you can come back to it if you want, if you're tired of being a liar. 
Just tell God whom you don't know, but say it anyway. He understands if you don't. Just say, I'm tired of being a liar. Help me to get into that boat and pay attention to the journey instead of to my own ego-centered distractions. And he'll help you. What kind of a life is it to be scared all the time? Your chief primary problem with fear is that you are so completely immersed in it that you have never had even the incentive to stand outside of it and notice the enormity of it. It is a very dangerous human situation for an individual and the masses so to be so completely overcome and taken over by fear that it is never noticed and identified as fear. When a person gets to the point where all he is, his nature, his characteristics, his words, his feelings, his whole outlook toward life, when a person is nothing, nothing but a mass of unconscious fears, his fate, his future is settled. In this room, we are going to catch somewhere, anywhere to start, it makes no difference where you begin to catch it to catch the trembling toward everything out there which you will tremble toward everything out there because the fear is here. Therefore, it's projected. Now, one little handle you can get on the, in the understanding that you are nothing but fear. You think you're something else. You think you're courage, for example, or spiritual. You're not. One way to begin to understand is to see that, now listen, this is it. Your nature is fear. Now look, what you've done already, would you can begin to expand from that, project, project rightly out that, and understand why you're afraid of the financial conditions of this insane world. If you are afraid of finances, if you are afraid of what other people can do to you, your own relatives, if you are afraid of the future, of what is going to happen to you in that vast unknown tomorrow, you look at the calendar and you say just six months from now, and you wonder what's going to happen then, you're going to be worse off, maybe better off, you don't know. If you understand that you are thinking fear. Now, if you think in fear right now at 9 o'clock in the morning, then also at 9 o'clock in the morning you will be unknowingly afraid of the person across the aisle in this room. Fear is afraid. What else can fear do but project itself outward into the future, into the world, into finances, and start to shake? Now, seeing that, look where we can go. We can say, all right, I'm afraid of being tied down to that relationship I stupidly got myself into. Or I'm afraid of whatever. You fill in the blank. If you understand that the fear itself is what you have to explore, already you have cut off false avenues of exploration and correction. Since when have you ever corrected any other human being on earth and have them reduce your fear? First place, they're uncor uncorrectable just as you are, as long as you misunderstand. 
The point is this, you are looking in the wrong direction. You're looking out and you're saying, what can I do about that man, that woman, that finances? Why don't you look and see that you are scared? That is your nature. That is what has to be explored. That is what has to be evaporated. That is where you have to keep a constant check on to see where you are making a spiritual error. Why try to change anything out there when it's going to stay the same as long as you are the same? Now you say that's elementary. Why don't you do it? Why don't you change yourself? Why don't you see that all you have is a fear nature, therefore everything you touch is going to be frightening to you too because it's going to be an echo back of what you are. Now I want to illustrate. Here's a king on a throne and all during the day he's going through all the business of taking care of the affairs of state. A minister comes up and he signs a document. There's the king sitting up there, crown on his head. All during the morning he's taking care of business affairs. And a minister comes up and he says, uh, Your Majesty, there's an enemy general outside the gates who has a message for you. The king says, Fine, send him in. So the enemy general comes in, you know, stern, playing the role. Watch, watch military people, by the way, when they know they're on camera. They immediately assume the stern look, right? The, the unflinching glare. They're psychopaths. The general comes in, his cap on, the military medals on him. He comes in and he hands a parchment to the king and stands there at attention. And the king takes the parchment, opens it, looks at it, nods, hands it back to the, to the enemy general and says, okay, I, I have the message. And the general stands there a little bit disturbed. He says, well, uh, king, you're supposed to uh, react in a different way than that. Do you understand what the message said? And the king said, yes, I understand it. Your, your king has declared endless war against our castle. I understood. Here's the message. Goodbye. So the enemy general wasn't quite sure what to make of that kind of a reaction, so he scowled a little more and stalked out. They always stalk out. They don't walk out. Stalk. You know the difference? He stalked out and slammed the castle door behind him as he went. And the king went about his business, signed a few more papers and discussed different things with the uh, ministers, the water supply of the castle or whatever. The next day, another minister came out and he said, Your Majesty, the enemy is approaching. They have, they have 50,000 troops, horseback, foot soldiers, long bows and crossbows, just surrounding the castle. The king said, Okay. And he went about his business. Next day, what the minister called an even worse report. They, they had besieged the castle, they had surrounded it. And the king said, okay. Next day they started firing their battering rams and their artillery, stones in those days, wasn't it? Artillery consisted of catapults against the castle. And the king said, okay. One by one, the, the officials in the castle came and gave gave bad reports to the king just like your faces do. Just as your attitudes do. I'm looking here at my box. I just, I don't happen to see any, any fearful notes in them just now, which is a, a miracle of the morning already. You know how many little notes I get, little words I get to people that come up with their evil little reports, their frightened little reports, confused little reports. You don't know because you don't have a box. I'm going to get a bigger one. <laughs> All the frightened, panicky little people come up to the king, and he says, okay, and then he goes back, you know, the orders of the day. This goes on for a year. All these bad, evil reports. And incidentally, do you notice that after a year, the castle is still there? Nothing has happened.
enemy still out there. Now they have 100,000 troops, 100,000 arrows hit the walls every day. Nothing happens. The king finally says, well, uh, Mr. Chief Minister, will you gather all the people and all the officials together into the big meeting hall here? I'd like to give them a little talk. And the um, official said, well, wait a minute, uh, Your Majesty, if we take all of them in the hall, who's going to watch the walls out there for the enemy to creep in? The king said, do what I tell you. Sometimes you have to yell at idiots who, you know, the only way you get is to hit them in the emotion. Do what I tell you, abandon the walls. Oh, everybody in. And the frightened little people all came in. They were wondering what was going to happen while they weren't watching the walls out there. And so here they are, several hundred subjects and officials in the hall. And the king says, now, he says, do, you, do you know what you're doing, oh foolish subjects? I want to tell you what you're doing. You claim to have respect and honor and deference for me, your king. That's what you claim to have, and you are... Go off a little bit and expand on that point. You understand that when you're afraid, because fear is a bad state, is there anyone here who thinks fear is a good thing? Yes. There is. Every one of you think it's a good thing because it keeps your, your horrible little nature in place. When you are afraid, that fear is a springboard for every type of negativity, of sourness, of resentment, of anger, of jealousy, of competition, of suppression, of hatred, of violence. When you are afraid, that breeds everything that is poisoning you. See, you have to get intensely personal about this. A sick human being, a lost human being, wants you to get personal only where he is faking something. He wants, he wants you to tell him how nice he is, how pleasant he is, how spiritual he is, and all that. But you're not, you're not really telling him about himself. You're telling him about his fake self, about all his, these monstrous lies about his nobility that he's built up. Let me tell you what it means to get really personal. If you will let truth, truth, not your sick friends, your flattering friends, if you will let truth get personal with you, it will hurt real bad, won't it? Because they see truth wants you to. It, truth doesn't do it to hurt you, but so that you can see where you've made the mistake that is punishing you. Truth can never do anything bad towards you, but you think so because you want to live from your old nature. So truth tells you where you're making a mistake, and if you want a clue, this handle we talked about. As to where you're making a mistake, or you're unconsciously punishing yourself, I want you to notice when truth starts to get close to what you're hiding, to where you are down inside, I want you to notice where you do indeed start to shake. And let's start off from a new, new viewpoint on this. This is, this is marvelous. This is beautiful. If you are living in fear of anything or of anyone, you are cheating yourself. Now, don't tell a lie. Don't you permit your old nature to sit here in this hall and allow you to continue to go along defending your old nature. If you can be here in this room and hear the pure truth, what you are hearing, if you could just be here and catch, catch yourself going into fear, into resentment or anything allied with it, if you can catch it and say, ah, at last, I am beginning to understand 
Why I can't even look at another person's face without a fearful reaction. I'm beginning to understand there's something horribly wrong with me. That is the beginning of a true life, of a nature free of this psychopathic world. But you have to do it. You have to understand, among other things, how that self-worship, worship of your negative states, is a single thing. That is, you worship what you presently are in your imagination. Now listen to this. Fear, terror, anxiety, a frantic state is all a matter of misused imagination. There's something wrong. They sense it. They don't know it. Knowing is a different thing. They sense there's something wrong when someone tells them, look, we've had all these peace conferences and peace treaties and we still have war. Maybe the next time it will be different. Maybe after this war things will be different. And people say, maybe that's true. Maybe people have changed or we have a new organization. The fear always exists in you when you ask a question of anyone else about anything psychological. You know very well there's no answer. Do you understand, if you don't, you can start tonight, to understand that fear itself, in its condition, in its state, is not a lie when you look at it from a certain viewpoint. That is, if you are afraid, that fear exists in you unnecessarily, but presently it is in you and taking over your life. So that is the problem. No matter what you do, whether you ask for good news, whether you get good news, whether you get bad news, both bad news and good news is bad news because it's a fearful lie. Question, ladies and gentlemen, when are you going to stop asking questions? When are you going to stop asking questions of other people? Oh, and by the way, you yourself are one of these other people that you're asking questions of. Now look how foolish it is. How ridiculous, absurd it is to continue for one hour longer to be a sheep whose only solution is to meet ten other sheep, whether they're inside you or outside you, and even hope for cheerful news. When all your own experience, I'm talking about your life, your own experience in this world, has told you when you go to that other sheep on the other side of the flock over there and you ask him what's the news of the wolf and he says well you know the wolf hasn't been seen for two weeks and you get excited over it already you're worried shall I tell you why because after 14 comes 15 two weeks consists of 14 days and you say I'm safe for 14 days, and you're not even that. I'm safe for 14 days, what's going to happen on the 15th? And so fear continues to go throughout your whole system. What we're talking about is the folly of asking any other human being for anything of a rescuing nature. Now the only reason, believe me, the only reason you do it is because it's a fixed habit and you even enjoy, if you can believe this, you can even enjoy hearing bad news. 
Because now, and I've told you this many times before, if you hear bad news, well, the wolf is going to attack tonight. We heard the report. Immediately, the self in you, the sheep-like nature in you, gets real excited. Don't you know that fear, terror is excitement? Of course it is. I am going to be attacked tonight by the wolf. By the way, when you do that, aren't you violent? What do you call that? What do you call tears? What do you call reacting in horror and terror to the news you just heard? What would you call it? And so, the sheep-like nature in any man or woman can't lose over the news. Whatever it is, it feels okay. Good news, he hasn't been seen for a month. How marvelous, we're safe. Let's throw a party, we're safe from the wolf for a month. We pushed high cost inflation away for a month, it's gonna get better, let's rejoice. Or bad news, it's going to get worse. The economic condition is going to get worse. The human situation is going to get worse. There are wars and there are rumors of wars. How good, what good news that I have something to feed on for tonight as I go to bed and maybe if I'm lucky it'll produce nightmares. See, you don't even know cause and effect yet. You don't know how the gang inside of you has it all figured out perfectly, exactly, so that it is never in danger of being ex extinguished. How it has the whole future, your so-called future, planned out so that the, whether the news is good or bad, you can take it and do something stupid, foolish, wrong, and destructive with it. Are you understanding the disaster of being a sheep who's only act of so-called intelligence is to wander around, amble around, and talk to someone else and get the source of his new, quote mark, existence, excitement from the rest of the flock. This is the world. Now, it is such an as I said before, earlier, it is such an overwhelming habit. The habit is not just a part of you, it is you. That's right. The habit of doing the wrong thing instead of the right thing with your life is your nature. It is the present nature you have and which you swear by. Which you want to hang on to at all costs. Which is why it is accurate to say you. Accurate to say that you, your old nature, your habit that wants any kind of news regardless of what it is, because it's thrilling news even if it's a bad or good news. It's accurate to say that you, in your present condition, is the only error, the only enemy there is. How do you break the hardened habit of being hungry for false life so desperately, cravingly hungry for it. How do you break that habit 
of going around and getting impressions from the world, which becomes your source of I-ness of you, how do you break it when you don't even know that it happened 300, 400 times to you personally in the last 24 hours? You didn't know what you did. Did you read anything in the newspaper that gave you a pleasurable feeling economically? Did you read anything, see anything on the news that made you feel either good or bad economically, socially? The impressions from the outer world come so fast and so furious that they overwhelm the small little force that you have built up as students in this class. They come so overwhelming that you can't stop even one during the course of the day and say to yourself, that's right. I felt good overhearing that interest rates on my account is going up 3%. All I did was say, unknowingly to myself, well, that's pretty good. By the time I get a little good news on my bank account. Now I said you are that habit. You are so much that habit <clears throat> of getting thrilled over the rates going up on your bank account that you and that bank account are exactly the same thing. I am telling you it is a fact. There is no difference whatever between you and that bank account. You've brought them together in your mind. Why did you get the thrill? And why are you going to be depressed next week when you hear the news the interest on your bank account went down three points? How are you going to feel about that? But see, do you remember the sheep? No matter what happens, they win. Now, it is entirely possible for anyone hearing this talk to break the identification, the connection with a bank account with a human relation that's either good or bad. It is possible for you to break all connections with what is called good news or bad news so that there is no longer any news for you as far as the social, economic, human, etc. world is concerned. There is no connection because you are no longer involved in the sick affairs of this world. Now you might hear the news that your bank interest rate went up three degrees. You might hear that and you would hear it as a fact, because on the physical plane, you have a bank account of so much money, because the habit system, the force of habit is so strong that it says, now is the time to get excited or depressed. Will you permit yourself to suddenly, in the middle of one of these talks, suddenly in the middle of one of your days, suddenly, right in the middle of it, to become, to become dissatisfied with a sheep-like life of going around and asking questions so that you can, you can contrive and get answers back and lie to other sheep and they lie to you.
apply to you. Can you write in the middle of your life sometime, like tonight or tomorrow, become dissatisfied with what you are doing, with the way you are reacting to life, become restless with yourself, and then stay right in the middle of that restlessness and do nothing about it so that you can begin to see an attack on you. It will come. It absolutely will come. And if you're standing there passive, you will see it for the first time in your life and you'll say, my God, this is the way it's been happening all these 40, 50, 80 years. But for the first time I saw it. And I'll tell you what the attack is. The attack is that of the old nature of the devil of the dark forces, which now will accuse you of many things, but will select one of them. It will accuse you of having no purpose in life. See, you can always contrive a purpose. I've got something to do down at the building. I better rush down there, down at work. I've got something to do. Oh, so many people are depending on me fixing them a nice dinner tonight. They, they, they want me to fix a nice dinner and they compliment. Thank heaven I have a purpose. That's your purpose, to fix food for people. It is.